We're live, I think. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Senator Katie Hester, and welcome to our second uh, hearing of the Joint Committee of Cybersecurity, IT, and Biotechnology. Um, I have the honor of co-chairing this committee with my colleague from across the street, Delegate Pat Young. So Delegate Young, would you like to introduce yourself and say hello? Sure. Delegate Pat Young, uh, House Chair for the Joint Committee. Uh, and while I have the opportunity, I want to and welcome Delegate Kelly and uh, Delegate Kipke, who are the new appointees from the House side. Uh, welcome to the Joint Committee, Senator. Welcome from me as well. Um, so let's see. Today we have a, a great agenda. Um, we'll hold on just one second. We'll first be hearing from our state counterparts, Chip Stewart, our Chief Information Security Officer, and Lance Shrine, our the Do It uh, Deputy Secretary. Um, that will be followed by a couple of presentations uh, from the local government perspectives. And we're joined by Kevin Canale from Mako, William Webb from Kent County as a health officer, and also Thomas Burke from Hartford County Health Department, IT Director. Um, that will then be followed by um, a, a really interesting perspective um, from Sean Riley, the State Chief Information Security Order Officer from North Dakota, due to our wonders of Zoom here. And then we'll wrap up with a perspective um, from a couple of private sector uh, organizations uh, from GCOM and also system automation. So that is kind of an overview of, our, um, of the agenda for today. Um, Let's see, so let's let's jump in. Um, our, our first two panelists, as I said, you come from the Maryland Department of Information, uh, Chip Stewart, who um, our state CISO, and he's responsible for statewide security practices and ensuring that our digital assets are safeguarded through a wide variety of cyber attacks, not a small job. And then we also have Deputy Lance Shrine, who has served as a Deputy Secretary for Do It since 2017. And today, both of them are here to provide their perspective on best practices and efforts to upgrade our legacy systems in the state government. Um, and I'm sure that they will explain the critical link between the legacy systems that we do have and our ability to protect ourselves from cybersecurity attacks. And so with that, I will welcome uh, uh, Mr. Stewart and Deputy uh, Shrine to, to the Joint Committee. Um, Senator Hester. Good. Uh, this is Senator Lee. I just want to say a quick thing before uh, you start out with this uh, wonderful joint committee. I'd just like to welcome uh, the new members, uh, Delegate uh, Jessica Feldmark and uh, my wonderful colleague, Delegate Ariana Kelly. I know you contribute much to this wonderful um, joint committee, and I just want to give a shout out to my wonderful colleague. Good afternoon, everyone. On with the show. Thank you very much, Senator Lee. Um, it's great to um, thank you very much. So let's let's move on then, Chip. I'll toss the ball back to you. Great, thank you. Uh, so thank you, uh, Chair Fry Hester, Chair Young, and members of the committee, including all of the new members. It's uh, great to see everyone, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, for the record, my name is Chip Stewart. I'm the State Chief Information Security Officer. Uh, Governor Hogan has taken many steps to ensure the confidentiality and integrity of Maryland citizens' data. Following the Annapolis Cybersecurity Summit, the governor signed multiple executive orders to address these concerns. These executive orders included the creation of a chief data officer, a chief privacy officer, as well as announcing a partnership with the NSA and universities throughout Maryland to enhance our cyber practices. The state has also put considerable resources into the MD Think and One Stop platforms to allow a better citizen-centric experience for Marylanders dealing with the government and protecting their data. These executive orders and a large IT projects further the administration's efforts to uh, centralize and consolidate IT platforms and resources throughout the executive branch. Also on the line is Deputy Secretary Shine, who will discuss the questions we were provided uh, by the committee prior to the meeting. Uh, Deputy Secretary Shine. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Chair Fry Hester and Chair Young and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Lance Shine. I'm the Deputy Secretary of the Department of IT here in Maryland. And uh, I will answer some of the questions and then hand it back to, to uh, Chip uh, to follow up with some more questions answered. Um, so the first question that was submitted to do it was at a very high level, 
Could Do It discuss how legacy systems upgrades fixes are prioritized and for the top five legacy systems that Do It is aware of, which could also include the comptroller systems that is currently being updated, can Do It provide information on costs, timelines, roadblocks, and strategies to address the systems? Um, so all legacy system modernizations that meet the MITDP requirements per state finance and procurement statute fall within Do It's oversight authority. Some examples of these modernizations are MD Think, One Stop, EMMA, BARS, and SPS, the last three of which are components of FEMIS. Uh, costs and timelines associated with these projects can be found in the MITDP end of year report submitted to the legislature annually. And there are a number of other legacy systems replacements in progress that can be provided upon request. Uh, second question, has do it or will do it request funding through ARPA or the Federal Infrastructure Bill for Legacy Systems? How much, how would do it spend the money if received? 50 million in federal funding. Uh, so do it has received 10 million in the, from the ARPA for telework initiatives to include the replacement of aging hardware, the addition of teleconference equipment, and a virtual desktop infrastructure pilot that will be conducted at do it. Additionally, we are collaborating with MEMA on the availability of funding for cybersecurity initiatives through the federal infrastructure bill. In the event that there are funds available, DOIT will likely utilize that funding for remediation tools and resources as a result of the cybersecurity assessments being conducted in FY22. And I'll hand it off to Chip for the next question. Thank you. So the question that followed that was, can do it share any key findings from the survey it's conducting specifically related to legacy systems, uh, even if it accounts for only a smaller percentage of the respondents so far? Uh, so I, I would be uncomfortable speaking to anything specific, uh, especially because we're talking about systems that may not have as much support as they need and where we've had to implement some compensating controls to keep them secure. Uh, in general, I, I think we have been making pretty significant improvements uh, to a lot of these aging systems. Uh, several were discussed on a call yesterday, uh, and uh, of the three that were of concern, uh, two were slated for upgrade uh, by the end of this calendar year. Uh, still waiting on information for that third one, but I think that that is demonstrative of uh, the investment and effort that's been put forth. Um, so I guess with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over uh, to the committee for any questions or any clarifications you might have. I'm looking around, um, you can either ra raise your hand and wave at me committee members or um, use the, the, the chat function or the hand raise function. Okay. Um, not, I'm not seeing any. Um, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm um, not having immediate access to the document that you referenced. Uh, I was kind of hoping if you could provide a little more detail about these five legacy systems and the general ballpark of the cost and the timeline for implementing those legacy systems upgrades. Um, I would have been happy to, to read that document you mentioned, but I didn't receive it in advance. So I don't know, Deputy Secretary, anything additional you want to add to that, or is your advice just to go read the report you mentioned? Well, I'll be happy to uh, talk about the, each project. Uh, the the you know each one individually is is um, really involved. Uh, MD Think, as you know, is is a few years into uh, its modernization. Uh, several of the applications have gone live. Uh, some of them are systems that had to be rolled out to each individual county. Um, and it's been going very well, um, and they're they're currently working to to complete the project. But it's basically modernizing all of the systems uh, in the Health and Human Service cluster, um, so that there's a single door uh, for citizens to enter, a single user experience across all the applications. Uh, we can use data to to leverage from. Uh, each program when appropriate to help a, a citizen uh, uh, understand the benefits they may receive from a, from a, from another program in, in the health and human service uh, cluster. 
And, um, you know, the, the, it's a pretty, I mean, it's, it's a pretty detailed, uh, project and I can definitely, uh, pull out those MIT DB reports and send them to you, uh, directly after this meeting. Um, one stop I can talk about as well. It's a, uh, another sort of one, one door so that for license permits and certificates in the state, uh, citizens go to one, uh, one website, uh, whether it's a permit from DNR or from agriculture or from, uh, uh, from Department of uh, Labor. Uh, it's a single user experience. Um, and, and it also allows uh, us to, to, to give a sign-in page or a, a kind of a dashboard to a, student, to a, uh, a citizen. So when they sign in, they can see the status of their different permits when they expire. Um, you can also suggest permits based on what permits or licenses they're receiving. For example, if you're, uh, you know, if you go to apply for your boat license, we can suggest, you know, here is where you would go for fishing licenses or crabbing licenses. So uh, we really just the, the whole idea is to make it very easy for a citizen to interact with the state uh, because most citizens don't know where to go to get a license or a permit. They just want to go to the state. And I can tell you now that I can name off a few licenses and you'd have nowhere to, no idea where to go, like hair braiding in Ocean City. You know, I mean, little obscure licenses that, um, that were hard to find and difficult to understand. They're now all presented in a single format, uh, a user experience that's the same across all of the license and permits. And instead of downloading a PDF, filling it out and then mailing it in, you're simply putting the information into uh, the system, and it's just it's much more uh, it's much easier for most people uh, to interface with the state using technology, and it's it's compatible with cell phones and tablets and computers. Um, and uh, you know, since the launch, we've we've put uh, hundreds of license and permits on the on the one stop platform. And we're in the in the midst of of modernizing, for example, DNR's Compass system, which is a legacy system. Um, it's no longer in support. We're supporting it ourselves, and um, and that can that can be a, a risky endeavor. So by modernizing that onto the one-stop platform, it's in a cloud environment that is very secure. We test it regularly, um, and um, it's also scalable. So that was very apparent during the pandemic when we used the one-stop platform for the, for example, for the MassVax pre-registration. Um, that wasn't a modernization because that was a brand new system, but the fact that we could scale it up to, um, you know, incredible, uh, to handle incredible amount of, of, um, of volume from, from the citizens, because as you know, when the, when the mass facts first launched, there were millions of people who wanted to get vaccinated and only hundred thousand or so shots. So it's a very difficult, um, uh, situation when you have that many people, all jumping on the you know the system at the same time. So, for example, we we could it automatically scaled up to over eighty four servers um, because eighty four servers were required for that initial surge of of uh, folks um, interested in 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 pre registering for their vaccination. Um, and then as that waned, the the number of servers lowered down to a reasonable number so that our cost was under control. So. Um, the, the, the EMMA and, uh, system is the uh, state procurement system that OSP is currently rolling out uh, or modernizing their, the, the previous system. Um, it's, uh, it, it will help tremendously in uh, improving, I think, the, the state procurement processes because everything will be in one platform um, and there'll be workflows that help tie in the financial aspects as well as the procurement aspects of, of, of the efforts. Um, and I think that the you know I I don't want to keep take too much time, but I, I'll definitely send you uh, the data as soon as this meeting is over. Thank you very much, Deputy Deputy Secretary. If you can send it to staff, then they can circulate it to all the members, so we'll we'll all get Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I'll send it to Mr. Mulford, and he'll disseminate it uh, to the appropriate people. I'm sure. Sounds great. Um, I also want to welcome, we've had Delegate Nick, Nick, Nick Kipke join us and also Delegate Sandy Rosenberg and also Delegate Sandy Bartlett. <laughs> so thank you all for joining us. Um,
Any other questions on this uh, first presentation from, um, from Do It? Delegate Feldmark. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you both for the, the presentation. My question really is a, a, a step back to, to bigger picture, and I'm, I'm not sure if others have a better sense of this than I do, but given the number of legacy systems that need to be modernized and sort of your um, prioritization and, and, and capacity, what, recognizing that, you know, time is, is a resource, right? But, but setting aside time for the moment, what resources do you need and, and what, what would you need to feel like you were really comfortable with that modernization schedule? You know, I mean, I, I recognize that you are doing, you know, extraordinary efforts to, to make the best of <laughs> the situation, but to really feel sort of comfortable and confident. And I, I realize that's with a grain of salt also, right? Like there's only so much confidence you can have in this realm, but um, what, what would that look like? It's an interesting question. Uh, you know, we are the facilitators of, of making the modernizations happen. The business owners are the ones who come to us with the request that we need to modernize. Of course, if if uh, if Chip Stewart's organization finds that uh, the system needs to be modernized because of the security risks, then we step in and we 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 work hard to understand what needs to be done, and when we either remediate or, or modernize. Um, so I have not reviewed every single legacy application in the state. Um, we typically wait for the business to say that, you know, their needs are not being met, uh, their system is not able to uh, fulfill the, the requirements of the legislature, for example. Um, and so it would take uh, a bit of inventorying and, and, and uh, uh, research to understand all the legacy apps that are in the state, because you mentioned all legacy apps, I just don't know all of them. Um, and each one, uh, would have to be analyzed on their own. So for example, if it was modernizing from, you know, an access database or a paper process with Excel, that's not nearly as expensive as if you were to take a mainframe system that had, uh, you know, hundreds or thousands of business rules and interdependencies um, and, uh, you know, hundreds or thousands of users uh, where they have to be trained and, and you know, the complex business flow. Uh, would be much more expensive. So uh, it, it's hard to come up with, I think, one number to cover everything. I, I don't think it would be accurate. Um, and um, on a case-by-case -case basis, we're absolutely uh, uh, happy to and, and willing to uh, analyze any legacy system uh, that you bring to our attention um, to tell you what the level of effort, the costs and the resources uh, that would be needed for that to be done. Thanks. I could just um, a shout out to Chip Stewart. Um, he's working as part of this with our team on the Maryland Cybersecurity Commission. Um, and he sent out, I think, 114 uh, surveys to all the individual units of government at the state level that have legacy systems. So one of those questions, you know, asks each agency to identify the legacy system. And I think it's important that we know both from a, a uh, you know, customer service perspective, a budget perspective, and a cybersecurity perspective, what our legacy systems are and how much and when we're going to upgrade them. And so I, I expected to have that conversation today and I, I guess and I guess we're still waiting for the survey results to come back. And so my suggestion is that we revisit this topic at our next hearing in a month. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, I'd really like to have something concrete to react to so that we can you know, move forward. I mean, the state is getting $3.9 billion through the ARPA. And it seems like if there's a one-time investment to be made, that this is probably the time to, to do it. I, I mean, but we can't do it if we don't ask for it. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to toss the ball back to uh, my co-chair, Delegate Pat Young, and maybe we can move on to the next uh, panel. Thanks, Senator. 
Thank you. So we're going to move on to commentary from local government perspectives. Uh, and I think all of us, especially on this, uh, this committee, known about the hacks that we've had, the um, system attacks that we've had in Maryland over the last year and even beyond that. Uh, so we're lucky to have a couple folks here from the Maryland Association of Counties. We have Mr. Kevin Canale, Maker Legislative Director, William Webb from Kent County Health yeah. Office, and we have Thomas Burke from the Harford County Health Department IT Director. Uh, so from you all, we're going to hear a little bit about the local perspective from your standpoint. Last meeting, we heard from MM, uh, MML and I think uh, you're going to provide a valuable perspective we can all benefit from moving to the next meeting. So, Mr. Canale, if you go first, and we'll then move on to Mr. Webb and Mr. Burke. Thank you so much, Chair Young and uh, Co-Chair Hester. We really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. For the record, Kevin Canale from the Maryland Association of Counties. And I first want to say that, you know, cybersecurity, of course, is top of mind for county governments, just like it is for the state. We know that cyber attacks present unprecedented range of threats from ransomware attacks to assaults on our critical infrastructure. So we're all on the same team here. Securing government information systems is critical and cyber intrusions can be very disruptive. They can jeopardize our sensitive information, power grids, public safety, and ultimately the delivery of essential services that our shared constituents rely on every day. So we know that as elections, public safety and healthcare systems, et cetera, employ more sophisticated technology, they become even more attractive targets. And the more interconnected these systems are, the greater the potential fallout. And amidst the pandemic, with so many folks working remotely, that also means that their devices are going remote. And that's far more difficult to secure from a county government perspective. All of these devices that go outside of the office and into people's homes become much more vulnerable to, to these cyber intrusions. And cyber criminals know that. We've seen a huge uptick in attacks targeting state and local governments across the country, uh, many of those highly publicized and oftentimes dealing with ransomware, which can create a, a major problem. So we need to work together to ensure synergy between the state and local departments responsible for information technology, critical infrastructure, emergency management, and everything else, right? Because cybersecurity is everywhere in government. It's essential that we, we, got, we got to get this right. So I think this is a situation where uh, oftentimes cybersecurity professionals, they've been working in silos. And we see that a lot in government, particularly here. And I think it makes sense somewhat because the information is, is very sensitive. And so you, you have a situation where it, traditionally everybody's been doing their own thing and they've been in silos. But at this point, because counties and, and local governments are using state legacy systems because they need to, um, we need to get out of those silos and we need to talk to each other. And I think... We've done a good job of that recently, especially with uh, this, this work group taking or this committee taking such an interest in this topic. And uh, you know, Chip and his team, they've been great. And I think we've made a lot of progress in actually talking to each other, getting the right folks to the table. So Chip mentioned uh, the, the, the legacy systems. I can say we do face some challenges there. The state is responsible for them, but counties have to use them. So I think we'd like to see more communication and, and not just with the, the county agencies that use the legacy systems, but also with the county CISO, CISOs or their equivalent, because it's really important that they are also in the loop and know what's going on. We think that's that's really essential. And I know that we have uh, Macho here. They have a panel, so I'll let them talk a little bit more about the challenges, especially during the pandemic that they've faced using the state's legacy systems but it's certainly something that we think we can do a better job with at least in terms of communication and hopefully uh, as, as, they, as we discussed, upgrading those systems. So another factor of course is cost. Um, you know, you used to just buy a firewall and then you were done. But in today's world, we deal largely with subscription services. Uh, those can be really expensive and they are ongoing costs. So that's certainly a, a cost is a factor. We'd love to hire the best experts in the world to come and work in every single county, but we're also competing with the private sector to attract the best of the best. Um, and that's just not an issue in cyber, but it's an issue that we face across all levels of government. But I think here it's particularly challenging because you're talking about tech, it's highly specialized and you know, the, 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 the private sector typically can offer more money. So that's something that we deal with as well, um, but we're hoping that we can make some strides there as well with maybe some programs and incentives to, to draw these folks into government. So one thing I, I wanna mention too, 
is that bond, the bond agencies are, are taking notice. And so now when county governments go up to New York to present their financials and get their bond ratings, this is one of the, the first questions that comes up. It's what are you doing with cybersecurity? So this is, this, is, this is affecting every level of government. It's affecting everything that we do. And it's affecting our bond ratings because the, the bond agencies know that if you don't have it together with cyber, you're, you're at a lot of risk and, and they don't wanna take on that risk. So it's important to mention that too, that this is getting a lot of attention, not just here, not just with, with cyber folks and with the tech industry, but also with the bond agencies of the world. So that also presents, uh, so it, it makes us wanna be the best that we can be and work with the state to be better. So I'll leave it again. I don't wanna to go too long. I, I will say we're very happy to be at the table here. We appreciate the effort, the joint effort to work with local governments as true partners with the state on this issue. I'm happy to answer any questions. And again, thank you to the committee for your time. Thank you, Mr. Canelli. We move on to Mr. Webb from the Kent County Health Department. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for having me uh, address the committee. Uh, my name for the record is Bill Webb. I'm the health officer for the Kent County Health Department. Uh, and uh, joining me today is Mr. Thomas Burke. I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you. Just like Bill said, thank you for allowing us to, to be here today. My name is Thomas Burke from the Harf County Health Department, and I am the director of IT. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. I, I uh, had prepared a slide deck, which, which was sent to Erica, and she's going to go ahead and move through. Please, if you cannot see the slide deck, uh, you know, put a message in the chat box and, and we will try to fix the situation. Uh, I, you know, we have a very brief amount of time, and my, my goal here is, is really to you know, articulate some of the fundamental challenges, IT challenges that local health departments face at this point. Uh, we are, you know, I want to limit it to, you know, four fundamental points at a very high level uh, so that we don't really get down into the weeds too much because any one of the points we could spend quite a, quite a significant amount of time discussing. But, uh, you know, really from, from our perspective, you know, we want to make sure that you're aware of what we've been facing. Local health departments are, are your boots on the ground for public health. We have been working incredibly hard in the last 18 months. The pandemic has presented us with an unprecedented challenge and that, that many of, you know, many of our, our employees have, you know, have worked very hard and, you know, we are, you know, it's, it's been a long slog and we are, you know, progressing one day at a time and, and, you know, we're doing the best that we can. From the information technology perspective uh, on the first page, our first most significant challenge at the local health department level is, is our patchwork funding structure. For those of you who are not aware, local health departments you know, receive funding through a, a state core allocation, which is then matched by the county. We also receive grant funding from both the state and federal levels. And we also operate fee for service programs that, that uh, you know, generate their own revenue. And the important thing to note is at the local health department level, we typically do not have funding dedicated for IT solutions. And what ends up happening is it is a patchwork. We are, we are you know, always struggling to find ways to fund specific uh, technologies and to fund the staffing that's required to implement that technology. And, and in, in uh, you know, especially with grant funding and fee-for-service revenues, the, the, the amount of money can vary significantly from year to year. So, you know, we, you know, we work very hard to provide services to our community and uh, especially in our fee-for-service, uh, you know, arena, most of our most of our customers are Medicaid customers, and you know we you know we find that the reimbursements for for those those services rarely cover our full cost of you know providing those services, and we're you know we're very frequently moving funds around to meet the technology needs that are needed. And uh, if there's one thing that you know that that I can say. 
is is that what would benefit the health departments above like, almost anything is is the ability to have a consistent line item funding from you know from the legislature to you know you know to give us a consistent funding stream to pay for uh, you know information technology services. You know, if you know, we cannot survive without computers and telephones. We cannot deliver services without without those resources today. And uh, it is, you know, it it is as much a core function of the health department as any of the specific programs. If we go to the next the the next slide, you know, our, the patchwork funding really, you know, there are times we have to take shortcuts, which means that you know we have to. You know, you know, we have to forego standardization, and we have to look at best practices and say what can we implement, what can't we implement. You know, typically many of our health departments are the IT staff are you know we're understaffed for the amount of uh, the amount of uh, systems and equipment that we have, and also you know another casualty in the you know low funding arena is you know, training for end users on specific systems frequently takes a hit when, uh, you know, when we don't have funds to fully implement it. So, so there are many times in my experience where we get a new system and, you know, the, you know, the solution is to learn it on the job as, as you try to use it. And that's, that's never a, a really efficient solution. At the end of the day, a pa you know, our, you know, our patchwork funding yields patchwork solutions. And, you know, that, you know, are the increased cybersecurity risks that we face at the local level, you know, are, you know, are substantial when you have a significant number of systems and you have a lot of, you know, silos as were, as was mentioned, you know, there's, there's, you know, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of different angles that malicious actors can potentially attack. And it is very difficult to cover all the bases with the number of systems that we have. If we go to the next slide, you know, our next, our, our next problem, you know, our next significant challenge is the local health departments have just an exploding portfolio of systems. You know, with every single new prioritized health issue comes a new IT system, a database or reporting tool. Local health departments very rarely have the opportunity to the choice of whether they want to implement it or not. And then with legacy systems or system, systems that are in place, you know, there are, you know, frequently there are upgrades and replacements, and that can happen with every procurement cycle. And every time you have to do an upgrade like that, data migration is a huge challenge. Training is a huge challenge, and that's never really factored in. You know, we, you know, the Maryland Department of Health consistently faces interoperability issues, and we always have problems with sort of centralized coordination. You know, information silos are common. You know performing double entry or even triple entry of the same demographic data into multiple systems happens more frequently than I care to even admit, but that's what we have to do to make the systems work. You know, our, you know, our ability to opt in or opt out is fairly limited because we are the retail outlet for all public health in the state. You know, if this is a data reporting tool or if this is an application system, we have to have it, we have to implement it, and we have to manage it. Go to the next slide, please. So this slide is not really intended to be legible. Mr. Burke put this together just to exemplify the number of systems that a typical health department has. You're not really intended to, to read the whole thing. But what's important to note is that you know this list was compiled recently. And for a typical health department, we have 129 systems that we have to manage. That's 129 locations where we have to create user accounts, passwords, and we have to perform security audits. And it is, you know, a significant undertaking to, you know, manage, you know, as each one of the systems and the software evolve and require patching and, and upgrades, you know, it is a full-time job for multiple people and, and, you know, we're here not to take care of systems, but to provide services to the community. And so this is just, you know, 129 systems in, in a typical local health department. And if we go to the next slide, you know, our third major challenge is the, you know, increasing responsibilities that are being placed upon our, our IT staff. You know, cybersecurity 
you know, best practices require ongoing monitoring and, and scrutiny and intervention. It requires patching. It requires checking account access. It requires, you know, have people been trained on the various, you know, uh, pitfalls and vulnerabilities of social engineering, you know, and that takes time. Also, the frequency, volume, and complexity of of the tasks or have increased substantially in the last five years. You know, it's not just a matter of checking the patch level of a server or who has accounts, but it's also making sure that, that, that you know, all of the different electronic avenues into your building are covered, that you have a security policy in place. And it, it is it truly a daunting task. And of course, many of these duties get delegated downstream from, you know, our parent organization um, and the last item to include is, you know, we have fantastic systems and, you know, the, the data aggregation is unprecedented, but our end users typically have a very difficult time extracting information out of those systems. You know, generating ad hoc reports, you know, typically requires the expertise of an IT person to, you know, help understand how can I get the information out of a system that I need. And that takes away time from, you know, you know, providing, you know, reliability and consistency with, you know, the uptime of various systems and the general duties that, that an IT person, uh, you know, performs on a daily basis. And finally, the fourth item that I wanted to mention, you know, which was, you know, which was mentioned earlier, you know, our, our staff salaries are, you know, are not competitive with the private sector or the federal government. Um, you know, we have, you know, we have folks that are paid substantially below market rate. And, uh, you know, it is, you know, it, it certainly hurts morale, um, certainly recruitment and retention for, for these very skilled, very technical individuals is very difficult in, in places where there are a lot of jobs and there are, you know, there are, you know, pay levels that are significantly higher. And it's also important to note that that you know from you know from the local health department level, do it and the Department of Housing and Community Development have completely different IT classifications that that pay at a substantially higher rate, and their you know their listed job duties you know are, are fewer on those specific classifications. So you know certainly it would be worth considering with the Department of Budget and Management. You know, to look at the, you know, the various classifications and see if we could bring our folks up to a higher level. And finally, the, you know, technical training for our IT staff is almost non-existent. Technical training is often very expensive and, and it is, you know, exceeds any of the available funding. Technical training is what helps us deal with one of the most rapidly evolving you know, professional areas that exist, you know, software and, you know, technology, you know, evolve, you know, <clears throat> on almost a weekly basis and staying on top of it truly is an educational challenge. And, you know, as a department, we do not do a particularly good job of offering, you know, paid training for our staff. So, you know, just to, you know, to recap uh, the presentation, you know, our biggest, you know, our biggest challenges are patchwork funding. You know, an explosion of an exploding portfolio of systems, um, you know, certainly increasing responsibilities for the care and feeding of all of those systems and a workforce that is that is underpaid and, uh, you know, undertrained. So uh, with that, I will take questions. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Uh, I know that we have uh, Mr. Burke to go next, but are there any questions for Mr. Webb and his presentation? Senator Hester, Chair Hester. Thank you, Chair Young. Um, Mr. Webb, thank you. That was that was very helpful. I was curious, are you were you speaking on behalf of Macho or just on behalf of your county? I'm speaking on behalf of Macho. Of Macho, okay. Um, we heard very similar, you know, um, prob problems or barriers from the local county IT folks and also the school. Uh, K through 12 IT folks. And my, my question was, it, how hard would it be for you to like um, sketch out what is needed to bring us to the next level? 
So for example, what is the bump in staff salary? What is the cost of the computers that you need? You know, how, if we want to alleviate this problem, this problem, what, it, what is the solution? Yeah, I'm not asking you to answer that now. I'm saying, is that something that Macho could do? I, I think, you know, Macho could put, you know, could, could work on it from the health department end. It would be very difficult to speak for, you know, obviously the school system or the counties. You know, we are, you know, we do work closely with MACO. Um, you know, I think that, that, you know, the good news is that the, the hardware, the machines themselves, the cost of, of computers have, 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 have been going down. And, uh, you know, obviously software and subscriptions have been going up. It's, uh, um, it, it, it would, I think that, that, you know, MAKO could make a, a statement related, you know, could work on something for health departments, but not for the other organizations. Yeah, that, that, that's, I was just saying that we're seeing this across the board, but if we had a potential solution for, that would help Macho, I mean, I would love to know what that solution is. I mean, we just had the deputy secretary talking about um, MD Think and how that's going great. Does that help you guys at the local level? <clears throat> Um, no, not, not, not a whole lot other than, uh, you know, other, I, I know that MD thinks provides uh, some, some important resources for social services and also for, uh, you know, some, some healthcare organizations. Um, but, but, uh, you know, really our, our biggest challenge is right now is, is, you know, staffing, qualified staffing and, and, you know, training for, for those folks, training and pay for those folks. Thank you very much, Mr. Webb. Senator Rosen, excuse me, Delegate Rosenberg, almost you there. Thank you. Um, how is a request made or what is the process that initiates a review of salaries for certain positions? Is that administrative who can make such a request? Can that be done legislatively? If you know. So my understanding from the from the local perspective is we submit a, a request to the Maryland Department of Health Office of Human Resources. They collect information related to uh, current market salaries, and then they submit that to the Department of Budget and Management, who then makes the final decision about that uh, for you know any number of classifications. The Department of Budget and Management is the you know is the deciding. Uh, oversight, you know, organization that makes that decision. Thank you. Any other questions specifically? Seeing none, Mr. Burke, if you have a presentation, I'd like to address the committee. Um, thank you, Delegate. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I wanted to just add on basically to what, what Bill was talking about. Um, I, I've been uh, I, I've worked for the state for 22 years now, all uh, within uh, MDH. Uh, at the time, it was DHMH. And uh, talking specifically about the job classifications, I have gone in those 22 years up to uh, two grades, and I cannot go any higher because that's just the nature of the classifications for IT positions. Um, furthermore, the, uh, the budget that he was talking about for my health department, just like the other local health departments, we have, we do have a budget and it's a zero dollar budget. Basically, we have to take everything out of uh, the excess of administrative budgets. So if there happens to be a very bad year administratively, then there's not going to be nearly as much spent on, on IT. And we're now getting so many more um, systems being pushed down on us, <clears throat> excuse me, so many more mandates uh, with with, uh, especially with the cybersecurity coming. And after the first year or two, we have to then take over the cost uh, of, of supporting those systems. And that's just something that, you know, is, is that we're not prepared for. So that's why one of the key, uh, key points that Bill brought up was uh, the patchwork funding, that if we had some way of a, a structured funding, that that would guarantee that our systems stay up to date, that they're uh, getting the right amount of patching, that we're using the right amount of systems. And uh, uh, that's really all I wanted to add. I'm here if, uh, if anybody has any questions for, um, you know, for someone like me who, who works uh, in the weeds. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Burke. 
Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Additional. Senator Hester. I'm sorry, I'm happy to go last, but I didn't see any other hands. So when we when we had this conversation earlier in the week with some of the with some of the locals, they were saying that there were existing state legacy state legacy systems and applications that impacted the work at the, the local government. And one example um, that I received related to the health department was called Star Limbs. <laughs> it's apparently a health department web application. It's an unsupported version still being required by the health department to enter health data. It requires active X controls and Internet Explorer to work. Um, it says many, many systems still require the use of Internet Explorer, which is deep, depreciated and unsupported. We're forced to jerry-rig these applications to work on VDI to move our computers to Windows 10. This is used by state and local health department employees. And so this is from somebody who you know, is just an IT professional, but could you, could you comment, is this Starlimbs thing a problem for you also? So uh, it, it is, and uh, maybe uh, Bill could, could explain a little bit more what Starlimbs is, but from an IT perspective, yes, we have to run it on Internet Explorer. And not only that, we have to run it in a compatibility mode. So we basically have to make the computers think that they're running a much older operating system and a much older version of Internet Explorer. And therefore, there are certain security features that would not be uh, covered in you know, the most recent version of, of uh, a Chrome or a Firefox or something like that, uh, you know, an up-to-date browser. So, so yes, it, it, it can cause uh, security issues. And uh, it's, we've been using that system for, for many years. And uh, it, it, that's just, uh, you know, we, I haven't heard of any type of update for that system at this point. So just to be clear, that's something that the Maryland Health Department could fix that would make your lives easier. Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm <laughs> actively collecting these examples. So if anybody in, out in YouTube land has an example of an antiquated state system they want fixed, <laughs> please send it to committee staff. Mr. Canale, do you have something to add? I, I, I do. I just wanted to, to mention too that there was a Senate bill that passed this year that does require MDH to conduct an evaluation and assessment of the technology communications, IT systems used by our local health departments. And I believe that that, that report will be due December 1st of this year, so pretty soon. Uh, so, so maybe that'll help to frame the landscape a little bit more in terms of what's available right now from the state in terms of you know, this technology, comms, and, and IT services. And I think that that could help us a little bit more in terms of MDH's perspective of, of what they're offering to our local health departments. Thank you, sir. So you know other questions. Thank you, gentlemen. And I will pass it back to Chair Hester. Thank you, Chair Young. Um, so I think we'll move on to our next segment. Um, I am, of course, a kind of a, a firm believer uh, in sourcing best practices from other states. And in June, we heard from the state CISO in Vermont. Um, for those who don't remember, the main takeaways from our discussion with John Quinn in Vermont were the value of IT consolidation from a security perspective and a financial perspective. Um, in the few years since they've consolidated their IT into one digital services agency, they saved $15 million. Um, so looking around the United States, uh, this time we've invited uh, North Dakota's CISO, Sean Riley, to provide his insights on the process that they're going through in North Dakota. They recently went through um, a significant modernization effort of their systems and practices. And I believe that uh, Sean's testimony will serve to reinforce those messages. And so I now like to welcome to the Maryland General Assembly, at least virtually, um, Mr. Uh, Sean Riley, state CISO. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Co-Chairman and distinguished members. For the record, my name is Sean Riley. I'm actually the Chief Information Officer, no security in my title, but the Chief Information Officer and Cabinet Member for Governor Burgum. And first, uh, I want to say I, I very much empathize with the conversations you're having here today and this listening to what, uh, what I've heard. This is the same conversation I'm hearing across many, many different states. Uh, we've been invited to come and talk with uh, many different assemblies and legislators, 
and it is a resounding theme across the nation. So I would like to uh, share some slides with you and I will, I have a lot of slides, but I will move through them quickly. Can you see those? Oh, it's, uh, looks like it's getting ready to share. There we go. Can you see my slides? Someone confirm for me? Thank you. Thank you. So, so first of all, uh, I do want to just thank all the committee members for, for having us in for a conversation. I personally, I've been working in the IT field since I was 16 years old. I've been a huge, huge advocate of cyber and the aspects of defending our states. And I just really want to thank you just for taking this conversation on because uh, many locations still haven't reached that yet. So I'm gonna move through some slides very quickly, please at any point, if you have questions for me, by all means. So first of all, we have a massive threat in the cyber world and we have to disrupt this threat. And the question I get most frequently from uh, legislators and assemblymen from across the country is, well, why? Why is this a priority today? So first of all, I'd ask you, can you name me a job that doesn't use computer technology today. And I see head shaking. And if you have the slides already, you know what the answer is, but if you don't, I won't keep in suspense. Well, it's folks who are Amish, right? Uh, great people, I love the Amish, wonderful people, but not a lot of computer users. The reality is, is that 99.9999% of all the jobs in all the commerce areas across the entire United States today use technology in some sense. Whether you're talking to a nurse, whether you're talking to an engineer, whether you're talking to someone who, who just wants to, to work at Applebee's, every day they are using technology in every single field. And let me give you another why. So another major why is the responsibility of government. So think of all of the breaches we've been hearing about across the nation for years now, right? At a private sector capability, you as a citizen, you can make a choice with your wallet, right? You have the choice of where to go. If you go to one store and they lose your data, you can choose to go to another store. If they lose your data, you can choose to go to another store. What happens when the state your citizens reside in lose their data? Well, for the most part, they put their hands over their face and they cry because there's not a whole lot they can do about it. The reality is, is that we have, as a government, a higher moral responsibility because we force citizens to give us information to obtain services they cannot get anywhere else. And given that responsibility, we must keep their data safe. So... We, uh, that has massively, massively exploded in the face of COVID-19. All of the changes in our technology, uh, the previous speakers from the, the health services, I come from the healthcare field. I'm a, a former regional XO for the Mayo Clinic, uh, ran all kinds of medical center technologies across, uh, across the nation. And here within the state of North Dakota, we also have our own medical centers. We have our own Department of Health. This is immensely different today where we must keep this data safe. Let me give you another why. Cities, uh, this is Bismarck in five years, right? Cities are becoming immensely connected. Uh, these cities are immensely intelligent now. Everything from the lights, from the streets, we have acoustic fiber in some of our roads now so we can tell when it's raining, when it's snowing. Maybe not so much snow in Maryland. In North Dakota, we have a bit of that. So we have to take care of that up here. Uh, we have to know when things are going to be managed. Well, we do that through technological means today. Here's another one. These two girls. These two girls went to Liberty Elementary, which is a little elementary school on the north side of Bismarck. I was invited to come to the school. I walk in the front door of the school, and the girl on the left, she's about rib high. She's about eight inches across, barely. She comes running down the hallway, and she goes, stop, don't move, right? And I'm like, wow, scary little kid. And on the ground, that robot, 
that the girl on the right has, that robot drove down the hallway, turns right, drives right up to me, and the head of the thing spins up and it looks at me and it says, please take your message. I bend down and I pull a little message out of the back and unfold it and so welcome to the classroom. The reality is, is that our children in these classrooms are learning these things every day. And this second grade classroom had codeforkids.org, they had Ozobots, they had Dashbots. They're learning programming skills today, right now. How do we defend them? And another really, really big why, especially for us in our state, I know this also hits Maryland, uh, very, very familiar with my uh, three-lettered friends that are based there in Maryland, but uh, we have a small school district up on the Canadian border, very, very small district, K through 12, less than 800 kids. That small district gives us a call and says, hey, we're having a problem with our network. We're not sure why. Can you help us out? Sure, certainly. We start helping them out. What do we find? North Korea. North Korea sitting in an environment. Why was North Korea sitting on a school district? North Korea was sitting on a school district because in the state of North Dakota, they believe they had a pivot point to the National Guard. And the National Guard is the ground defense force for our nuclear bases at Minot and Fargo. These are military nuclear bases with military nuclear secrets. And these bad actors were attempting to use these schools with this technology that these second grade kids are learning as a tool to get there. This is not science fiction anymore. These things are happening every single day. These are the realities of what we're dealing with across the nation. And this is the reality of what we were dealing with here in the state of North Dakota. So we said this must be disrupted. We did the how. Well, how comes from our, our state government, uh, our legislature and our governor sat down and started working through programs with us. We sat down and created a vision, an overall vision, a strategy of workforce and operations. We built a team of all sorts of organizations. We brought together more than 40 different organizations around the state. Those organizations included private sector, they included public sector, uh, critical infrastructure representation, legislative uh, representation, executive branch, et cetera, et cetera. We also brought in some of our federal partners with that. We created a vision out of this of how might we deliver world-class technology and services. We created a strategy around a whole of government response. We didn't want a county to have to defend at by themselves. We don't want a Department of Health at a county level to defend by themselves. We don't want to have a school having to defend by themselves. How can we defend each other at a whole of government level? We created a workforce target of every student, every school, cyber educated, kindergarten through PhD. We created an operations target of hyper automation. Now, if you're in the IT field, uh, you'll get a smile at this, but this is how cyber works today is that it is not human being fighting human being anymore. It's more like Robocop versus Terminator. The reality is, is that we are artificial intelligence versus artificial intelligence every single day. And within the state of North Dakota, we defend over 1,100 attacks per minute. That equals 2.2 billion attacks per year that we're defending against that are fully 100% automated. And all of the attacks that we defend against are now 99.9999969. Defended by artificial intelligence and automated systems. So results. I want to quickly go in, gave you the, I, the concept, what we kicked off, what did we get done? What have we been able to do in strategy? So in a strategy standpoint, brought forth a bill, Senate Bill 2110. This was signed into law in 2019. They gave a central shared service, and that is an organization that reports under me. Uh, that is actually where our CISO actually leads. That central shared service is part of the North Dakota Information Technology Organization. We have the cyber authority to engage and defend the entirety of the judicial branch, legislative branch, executive branch, higher ed, K-12 cities and counties. So any governmental entity within the state had the ability to be able to leverage our technology, leverage our capabilities, leverage our teams, in any which way necessary to be able to defend themselves. We were able to get that law passed 47 to zero in the Senate, 88 to zero in the House. This was absolutely uh, 
all aspects of politics came together. There was no Democrat versus Republican conversation in that sense. It was very much the safety and security of our citizens' data is above and beyond the politics of the room. And that is how we were able to proceed with that and very much able to pass that. Uh, the, uh, the saying that we like to put out there is that zeros and ones are not blue and red. So we, we walked through that with many, many legislators. And as you can see, it was very successful in that sense. We also then uh, brought forth an additional law uh, and that bill came out, of, or that law, I'm sorry, came out of House Bill 1314 and, all, and additionally House Bill 1417 that gives us significantly improved visibility to all government security aspects across the state. So basically we can manage any incident, we can manage at any operational level. And we also extended this now to be able to do support agreements with other governments outside the state as well as tribal nations. Uh, within the state of North Dakota, we have five uh, reservations, which are represented by 82 tribes on all sovereign nations. And those sovereign nations, uh, you can think of it as a, a completely independent country sitting within your state. So, and we work directly with those sovereign nations also to help defend their schools and also to help defend their institutions as well. So what are the results in the workforce side? is really on the education side. Every student, every school, cyber educated, kindergarten through PhD. We created computer science standards. We created cyber science standards. We believe those to be the first uh, time in the, in the nation that have been done. We took those two standards and integrated them. That's the first time we believe that to also be done in the nation. We have 2,500 teachers that are credentialed in computer and cyber science. Uh, we deployed it to every single school district in the state, and we did that all in under a year's time. We are now actually extending that with additional tools, with additional funding, with additional technology uh, to be able to expand that out. But that is available now, kindergarten through PhD, because we also deployed simultaneously making cyber programs available in every higher education institution in the state. So all of our 11 university systems, plus all 181 school districts, Every single school kid, kindergarten through PhD, has the ability to be able to learn and is becoming part of their dedicated curriculum within computer science and cyber science. Results in operations, and uh, I would guess this is also part of what you really want to get into in depth, so I'm happy to get deeper in this uh, if, with any questions you may have. But we did an assessment across the entirety of the state uh, 572 governments, all of which responded that we went through, did an assessment of where their security lied against uh, the standards of security. We had uh, a person that is a NIST, actually helped write the NIST frameworks, who is on our team. We have other people who come from SANS who are on our team. We created a standard methodology to be able to assess every single organization in the state. We worked with all of them to be able to go through their assessments even through uh, the COVID year, because uh, some of the assessments ran into uh, 2020, we were able to process those through. Now on a statewide across the board level, the baseline on a zero to five scale, zero being no cyber at all, five being super awesome, we were under a one across the entire state as a baseline. Now we have uh, certainly pockets that are substantially higher than that, and certain organizations that were certainly higher than that, but also the organizations that were lower than that. So within that assessment, uh, we brought forth models to be able to bring up that maturity across the entire state. We are currently in most of our organizations in between two and three. We have some of our organizations that are just shy of four, but we are moving towards a comprehensive target across the state of just under four. And that includes everything from you know, the, the largest school districts that we have in Fargo, West Fargo, Bismarck, the bigger uh, metro areas, all the way down to the little one person library with the 82 year old lady who is the happiest lady you've ever met in your life, who hands out books and has five computers in her library out in the backwoods. Uh, everything in between is part of that defense network and is part of that system. And now as part of the uh, rules that we talked to as well, I'll talk to that in just a minute, we've also been able to expand to help defend in other states and other jurisdictions as they've asked. So we're also leveraging the kids. Uh, we have a wonderful video that if you don't smile, I don't know how you can't smile because it's these uh, 
third grade kids who helped us to install our Cortex agent. This is the actual application that is on our endpoint. They helped install this on 50,000 Chromebooks across the state. So we had all these kids who were able to actually get some great cyber experience, part of their courseware, part of their education, and helped us defend the state all at the same time. Uh, had a great target for them, given 50,000 devices if they could hit those. And these kids actually did it in uh, under a month. So super, super awesome, helpful there. We've also launched programs on a public level. It's called Defend. Uh, and if uh, you're familiar with North Dakota, ND being our short, so Defend ND. And that is uh, something we actually, we won a, uh, an Addy Award. If there's any award I never thought I'd ever win in my life, it would be an Addy. It's like for commercials and things like that. We won an Addy Award for our program on this. Uh, but the great output, though, is, is that the public has become engaged in knowing cyber hygiene, understanding those aspects. It's also helped us to be able to engage in areas where, where maybe we didn't have enough teachers who had been cyber certified yet. Uh, some great things that we've been able to do around the state also helps us to be able to leverage on the small business front. Folks who have no cyber teams themselves and maybe don't even have IT teams themselves. So the small businesses are in the highest of risk across a, the country, and this helps them out. So an outcome, we are now defending the judicial branch, legislative branch, executive branch, as well as higher ed, K-12, cities, county governments. That's more than 250,000 people every day. It's about three quarters of a million devices. So when people think of North Dakota, they typically think of two things, small and cold, and maybe they think of the movie Fargo. Uh, one, it's not really that cold. That's in the movies. Fargo would actually happen in Minnesota, not here. Uh, but <laughs> we're not small either. 252,000 users on a daily basis makes us about the same size as Starbucks, which is a Fortune 30 company. So the reality is, is it's a substantial network that is being defended through a very different model than you'll find in most places. This is being done by a cybersecurity team of only 51. And overall, this is saving us approximately $440 million per year by doing this in a central environment. So, um, Senator Hester, you mentioned uh, benefits of dollars in a centralized environment. It absolutely can be done, centralized, unified, converged, however you want to approach that. There's different models there. You absolutely can save money. There are downsides for individual entities, and I'm happy to speak to that if you want to speak to that but there's a lot of money that can be saved and you can create a vastly bigger security environment. So on the what's next side, uh, we still have a lot of things that we're doing. We're not quite through all the school district deployments yet. Uh, some of those, we have one university system still to be deployed in the defense network, but we're moving to cyber range competitions. This actually kicks off here in October for Cyber Awareness Month. Uh, we're calling this Cyber Madness but we have uh, numerous schools, dozens of schools that are gonna be doing blue team, red team competitions. So instead of uh, the, uh, the typical sports, they're doing esports and not video games, but in cyber games. So they're having cyber warfare competitions with each other. And we hope to uh, crown our first state champion perhaps here in the, in the near future as they go through those competitions. Uh, we also do multi-government defense, tribal, tribal nations, other states, schools, counties. Uh, I, I speak with a lot of different states on these opportunities and some of those organizations out there. I've talked to states where one of the school districts in, in one of the states, I won't name them right now, but uh, they have about 110,000 kids in the one school district and they had a grand total of zero cybersecurity professionals for that school. Uh, that, that is much, much, much more common than I wish it was. K-12 is incredibly vulnerable and they almost never have anyone other than the fifth grade teacher that knows how to reboot the computer kind of thing. Um, even, you know, even some of the largest districts we've met, again, 100,000 kids, 50,000 kids, large districts around the country still don't have a cyber defense organization. So we've offered that out to uh, parties that have asked and been able to extend that out in, in many cases. We're also now in the Internet of Things space. So within the state of North Dakota, we're expecting to have over a billion sensors in the next nine years. We have a huge agricultural aspect. Uh, we now work in the aerospace, massive in the aerospace, because we have most of the drone test sites here within the state, uh, space, agriculture, environment, defense, et cetera. 
So huge new platforms in that sense as well. And really in summary, what this really boils down to is that second grade classroom. When I walked in that second grade classroom and I saw these kids and this, this gal, she was, she was one of the kids in that classroom. She's got that little robot sit in front of her. Well, it, she's learning to code by using different colored markers. And the different color makes the robot do different things. It blinks, it turns left, it turns right, all those kind of things, right? Second grade girl, she's learning how to do this. The reality is, is these kids are going to be inventing things we haven't even thought of yet. And today, for them to learn, we have to defend them. And that's part of what really was the major motivator here. And that's really how we were able to get the legislative will, and the political will, is to really look at our children and say, they shouldn't have to deal with this. They shouldn't have to be worrying about whether a North Korean actor is sitting on their environment trying to steal nuclear secrets. We have to be able to fix that. And then along with that came all of those other aspects that you said. And uh, again, I just wanted to move through this deck very, very, very quickly for you. But I am happy to take any questions, happy to uh, answer any aspects and be helpful in any way that uh, is for your committee. That was a fantastic presentation, Mr. Riley. Thank you so much. Thank you. Questions from members? Delegate Felmark. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the presentation. I guess I have a couple of questions. Um, they may be related. Uh, one is sort of looking at, um, you know, you stressed sort of the, the bipartisan support, which I think makes a lot of sense given the, the nature of the issue. But looking at um, the relationships with other independent branches of government, um, other independent um, entities like the school system, you know, how, if you can, speak to those relationships. Um, and then also you did mention sort of some, uh, some, some downside and some, you know, some, some costs um, for, uh, for certain agencies in the, you know, as a result of the consolidated approach. And I'm just wondering if you can speak to that a little bit more. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, Chairman and uh, uh, Delegate Felmark. So, if I were to first, I'll talk to the to the po uh, political subdivisions aspect. So, within the political subdivisions, uh, in our in our environment, the school districts are used to being very very independent. Uh, they're used to having very uh, substantial local control over their decision making. The counties and cities are also in that situation, a little less so than the schools, but it's substantial in their ability to be very independent. And they don't typically have uh, a lot of aspects where the state as a, as a umbrella makes decisions on their behalf. Uh, to be able to work with that, we brought in right out of the gates, we brought in uh, teachers unions conversations, we brought in Department of Public Instruction, which would be Department of Education in other states. Uh, we brought in the university system leaders, uh, the chancellor, a uh, couple of the presidents of the of the research based schools, a couple presidents of the of the uh, more two year schools, and we we went through a conversation. And I would say it's it's very easy to get the conversation started. There are a lot of details in. I can uh, I can spend as much time as, as the committee has if you want me to expound on that. But the the second component of the downside, the downsides that people have really comes down to loss of control. So there was a mention previously here about uh, Starlinks, and I'm familiar with Starlinks from um, I, again I come from healthcare, so I'm familiar with a lot of that technology base. Uh, Let's take that as an example where today you have to have encapsulated Internet Explorer, right? That's an old technology that no one's deploying anymore because that's, it's, et cetera. 
if we come in with a cyber defense platform, there may be places where we would be looking at an organization and saying, ah, that is super legacy. You really, really want to get rid of that. Uh, we may have forced the hands of some places. Now, we'd keep a, a legacy technology, uh, which we call technical debt. We have a technical debt uh, in inventory. That technical debt inventory that we have for the state of North Dakota is a little over $1.2 billion worth of technical debt. So of, of a substantial amount of technology that is past its prime that should be going. There are aspects of that where you have to go back to the legislators and say, well, now, now we have to pay for this. Um, there are things there where we work. Now, we, we spend a lot of time working very closely. So if we go to, say, a city, and that city has a technical debt item that needs to be replaced, we come with them to the legislature. So the city isn't going forth and having to do this on their own. We come with them. So there's, there's aspects of things then from a technical base that you'll find really fast that you do this that need to get replaced sooner than later. So there may be some more operational expenditures that need to be considered. Th there's still technical debt in our environment, as I mentioned, 1.2 billion. The reason that's still there is that's lower risk items than some of the things that we got rid of right away. There are certain things that when we came forth, we said, no, these are extremely high risk items. Legislature agreed with that, gave us the funding and boom, those things are gone. The rest of these things, we put them basically on a risk register and we said, we'll get rid of these in order of their risk to the state or, or in order of their risk to the citizen, depending on the product. Uh, and I could uh, I could definitely go deeper into that, but does, does that help answer your questions, Delegate? Yes, thank you. That is helpful. And I guess that um, your in inventory of technical debt, right, I think really gets at sort of my, my earlier question. Um, so if you have, and I, I won't ask you to take more time now, but maybe if offline, if you can follow up with anything about sort of how you went about the process of that inventory and, and compiling that assessment of your statewide technical debt, um, I think that might be really helpful if you're able to share. So happy to be helpful any way I can. Are there other questions for Mr. Riley? I might ask one more, Mr. Riley, uh, if you don't mind. Um, you know, I've been thinking about how the state, how we in Maryland take a whole of state approach to, you know, in increasing our security. Um, and I'm, I'm curious whether you, you have like a statewide group that includes these political subdivisions. And if so, like how it's organized um, and also the relationship with the legislature and the, um, the judicial branch. Cause right now we've kind of got a wall, you know between our three branches. So if you could talk about how you're currently kind of governing it and then maybe how you got there, it'd be great. So uh, Senator Hester, we, we also have a very substantial wall between our political subs and the three branches in, in the vast majority of things. Uh, but we were able to bring together numerous groups. So uh, first uh, with the counties, we have what's called the League of Counties. It's an overarching organization that brings all the counties together. I, be I believe Maryland has the same uh, group. The League of Counties was a group that we presented to several times. And we didn't take the aspect of saying, hey, we're from the government. We're here to help. We did not do that. We came in from with a, we understand you have a problem. Can you help us understand your problems? And frankly, it didn't take long to get people talking about ransomwares and PO scams and purchase orders, theft and all kinds of different things like that. And as you started to realize they're not alone, that was an immense motivator. Now we have taken great pains to make sure not to ever point out anyone individually. So we do not, we do not release information on any individual issue unless it's mandatory by by some federal law somewhere. Uh, so we, ne we never point out a city's issues, we never point out a school district, et cetera. What we do is, is we, we have actually uh, open records laws that 
that protect our cybersecurity data. And in this sense, we can come forward and say, these are the issues across the state, but no one is individually embarrassed. Taking that avenue really helped move things along. And we started with the counties aspect. We then, we also have the League of Cities and we have several other areas with Chamber of Commerce and different groups that we're able to, to work through with uh, the commerce departments. That helped them. On the K-12 side, uh, K-12, kind of asked us to come help them first. And then from there, we started meeting with their superintendents bodies and they have different uh, groups of superintendents. And it was the same thing. We asked, do you want a fifth grade teacher who's also driving a school bus, who's also teaching basketball to be your cybersecurity person? Or do you want them to be a fifth grade teacher? And as we kind of work through that, because even, even again, our largest districts, the, our largest districts had only a handful of cyber staff, just not a lot of folks. Uh, and we found that with other states too, with even districts of 40,000, 50,000 kids, oftentimes don't have a cybersecurity person and don't have a team and don't have the tools. So that's, that's part of how we approach this, but kind of in the small groups, once we got some momentum behind some of those groups, uh, the governor was very, very, very behind this. The head of the university systems were behind this. The head of the Department of Education very behind this. And frankly, it just started snowballing. And uh, I will tell you, my own leadership team, when we started this, told me I was crazy. And if, if you uh, looked up my bio, it says crazy CIO on there. So that's me. Uh, but they said, no, these, these folks never work together. They don't want to work together, et cetera, et cetera. But once we started really explaining the issue and asking the problems and getting people to share with it, it actually, it kind of took care of itself because everyone was then saying, please, how can we solve this? So when we came in with our first bills in 2019 to be able to do this, the League of Cities came and testified to our benefit. Uh, the League of Counties came in and testified. Numerous superintendents came in. All these other organizations all came in and supported the bill. But frankly, we didn't have to do a lot. We just sat there and said, yep, it's our bill. And how can we help? Does that help answer your question, Senator? It, it, it does. Um, it looks like uh, Delegate Young has a question. Thank you, Chair Hester. Uh, Mr. Riley, one, appreciate the presentation. Extremely informative. Uh, and everything you're saying, I think, folks on this committee, um, you're speaking our language. Uh, I come from the budget committee and I'm curious about how it's all funded. Fee for service, uh, is, it paid, is it all through appropriations every year? How, how do you provide all these great services and the security for your entire state? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman and Delegate. Uh, so Delegate Young, that's probably a couple hour conversation on its own right to get into detail. I'm happy to do that with you, but so we have, we have a combination of funding structures. So in our case, our, our organization, the NDIT, North Dakota IT, is primarily special funded. So in the special funded structure, I have uh, primarily fee for service, but I can only use that directly for the executive branch. Now I have a different funding model when it comes to sources that are given for uh, other the other two branches, the legislative and the judicial branch, for the most part, are just direct appropriations for us to cover those aspects. When you get into cities and counties, there's some aspect of formula and there's some, uh, some aspect of general funds. Then when you get into the schools, there's a whole other aspect where there's formula components. Now, I will say cyber is, is complex in that sense because we have multiple services that we offer to any organization. So the legislative branch uses our cyber, they use our network, uh, but they don't have to use like our data center services or those kind of things, whereas the executive branch does. Um, so we have a pretty complex funding structure, but it's kind of different buckets for each of the aspects of government, but happy to walk through that with you. And I would say we would get my much smarter finance guy on the call who can tell you way more uh, detail than I can, but I, I can give you that kind of as a high level. Does that help, Delegate? Sure, I'd love to talk to you offline with, no, maybe not for a couple of hours, but, you know, detail about Sorry, how those structures work. But no, I, I, we've heard from other states too, and that has been a question about 
how is it funded? Um, and that's part of the question we're having now too as we move forward. How do we expand service? How do we do it better? And how do we pay for it? And and I would say, Delia, so right now uh, we're we're in an interim state with our legislature today, and we have an interim study that is running right now for restructuring the cybersecurity funding. So that is something that the, our one of our financial committees and the appropriations committees are going through to determine if they can do a, a more streamlined approach because it is very complicated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Riley, I think, you know, if you if you have time in the future, I'd love to have, sit in on that um, offline conversation. I think probably someone from budget and tax on the Senate side would be a good ad also. So um, really appreciate this the whole estate approach. Very helpful. I'm doing one last check. Does anybody have additional questions for Mr. Riley? Okay. Um, well, to be continued then. Thank you so very much. I'm going to read all those bills and we'll figure out a next time to talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so now moving on to our uh, final panel of the day. So we've looked at a variety of public sector perspectives and we've also excited to have representatives from the private sector to join us to provide their perspective. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of these two companies, GCOM specifically offers solutions to modernize operations and optimize digital engagement in the areas of health and human services, licensing and regulation of public safety. Uh, system automation assists government agencies in their efforts to protect software as it relates to digital regulation management. Um, so first we'll hear from GCOM and we're joined by their chief executive officer, Kamal Rawani and their chief client outcomes, Christine Pascarella. Great, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for inviting us to present uh, to Maryland's uh, Joint Committee on Cybersecurity, IT and Biotech. Very uh, honored and pleased to partner with Maryland on a variety of IT projects uh, within the agencies and with DOIT. Um, we'll start with some introductions uh, of myself and give you some background of myself and uh, Christine Pascarella. We can go to the next slide, please. Okay, um, I think both of us, uh, what we really have in common is we've worked in public and private sector settings. Uh, Christine and I both worked for the city of New York in uh, different roles. My last role in the city of New York was the CIO of Health and Human Services as a domain across nine different organizations under the Bloomberg administration. And Christine also, uh, she'll describe some of her background. My background is, is uh, across both public and private sectors around technology, innovation, and digital transformation. Um, Christine, I'll pass it to you. Thanks, Cole, and, and thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Chairman, delegates. It's great to uh, join you today. Um, as Kamal said, I have a background as a New York City CIO, so an agency CIO, um, but most recently I've spent the last 10 years at, at Gartner helping clients in both public and private sectors define and prioritize their modernization initiatives. So it's very germane to, to the topic today. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, Christine and I will go back and forth. So Christine will go through a few slides and we'll pass back and forth. And we'll, we're going to focus on legacy modernization and how to best leverage legacy modernization for the best outcomes. I think Senator Hester asked the pivotal question around how do you use those funds in a way that has a payback, as, a, as in viewed how you view those funds as an investment with a return on that investment uh, to governments. So I'll pass to Christine. Yeah, and and there's a lot of words on this slide, so don't be don't don't be nervous. Um, but I think one of the things that is part of this holistic conversation is you have an extreme amount of funding that is available now. So there is kind of a pivot point, a trigger point for modernization, and that modernization is also linked to mitigation of risk and and higher levels of cybersecurity. So if you if you take it all as as a holistic look. You have to think about what is the type of support that is available through ARPA um, that, that states are funding, and that really focuses around cash assistance and subsidies, extended um, programming for WIC, SNAP, TANF, and, and the benefits um, 
programs, homeless care for additional support programming, unemployment insurance through benefit um, extensions, as well as workforce and training programs um, where, where jobs have or industries have shifted need, um, healthcare expansion and capacity, ability to serve uh, underserved populations. And, and um, I think we heard very eloquently from, from Bill and, and, and Tom earlier about all of the needs within the healthcare perspective, extension of, of connectivity and access and increasing internet access for all, almost as think of it as, as a fourth utility after you know water, gas, electric, um, is really becoming something that should be in every household everywhere. Um, extended investments for public transportation and airports in terms of, of extending the, um, not just the networks of those, but facilitating sensors and use of internet of things. And, and you've already seen a lot of that in, in Maryland through cashless tolling and so on. Um, distance learning, supporting for um, educational initiatives and learning loss. So you have all of the, these topic areas and, and capabilities that are, are able to be funded. So if we contrast that with the typical areas or the highest, highest uh, over the last two years, the highest levels of expenditures in state governments, really at the top is legacy application modernization to reduce risks of existing data centers, older applications, moving those applications to the cloud for scalability, stability, security, digital frictionless government. And, and Kamal will talk a little bit about frictionless, but really that, that ability to take your existing services, meet the, the residents where they are online, um, promoting digital passports, online connectivity for meetings, all of the things that we've been doing over the last year, but expanding that. Um, expanded broadband and Automation is a huge part of what states are starting to spend a lot of money on. We talked, you know, I think Sean Riley said that very well in terms of of its, um, you know, Terminator versus RoboCop in the sense of of having a an automated um, facility. And many states are spending a lot of money not just on security automation and processing and monitoring, but also from an interaction perspective, doing more with less. Um, and pushing through more sophisticated um, decision making. And then the last piece is zero trust security. So verifying every interaction. So if we take, if we go to the next slide, if we take those two of where there are funding for certain capabilities and where states traditionally spend the majority of their IT expenditures, we, we really think about there's four major categories of initiatives and modernization that everything is, is driving at this moment. And the first is assistance, and that's really that support for residents, support for Marylanders, um, how to, to what, that, what that manifests as basically new eligibility and grant management software applications, new programs for EBT card payments, e-payments, facilitation of e-payments um, to realize those benefits. And then certainly eligibility programs may be running off of existing older case management solutions. We've seen that in a number of states. And those programs all have very sophisticated embedded business rules to determine if an indi individual is approved for a program. So most of the states have applications in this space that have been running for decades, potentially. Um, so that's a huge area for modernization and or replacement. Um, on the digital frictionless government or engagement side of things is another IT investment that would allow states to have the cap capability for more modern, easy to use access citizen, citizen facing services. Um, Kamal will talk about more of that concept in a minute, but you know, in our daily lives, we've all been become so accustomed to easy to use applications and experiences that sync across our phones and tablets or um, you know, allow us to, to really do whatever we need to do across any number of different channels. And this is where many area, many folks are using the ARPA funds for digital citizen records and certifications, learning management systems, or virtual mobile inspections 
Um, you already have some of those items, but it's really thinking about how to extend the reach and range, how to make it easier to use. On the predictive side of things, this is the automation and um, sorry, <laughs> I'll wrap this up. Um, but, uh, oh, we lost our slides. So at any rate, um, you know, the, the, the predictive side of things are investments that in the automation of, of things provide um, zero intervention to provide critical services. And when you think about from a security perspective, that's also an important part of, of uh, there we go. And we're back, <laughs> important part of, of um, investment um, and protecting security side of things. The last piece is really the, we talk about edgeless and that's the idea that infrastructure that enables applications and system connectivity is everywhere and anywhere. Um, so those applications um, need to be supported from broadband, 5G, um, mobile device support investment um, for, for the state. So the, this is, these are really the, the types of investments that we're seeing across across states. So let me turn it over to Kamal in the next slide. Thank you. I'm gonna zoom in on, on the concept of frictionless government. We talk about frictionless, edgeless, and predictive government as part of our, our next gen strategy. You know, GCOM focuses uh, almost exclusively on work with state and local governments around the country. And the idea of frictionless is really raising the bar. And there are not very good examples uh, in the US uh, that have adopted this in a holistic way. Uh, and I, what I mean by that is most governments, because of their siloed nature, and we talked to the previous speakers have talked extensively about how there are lots of silos. And those silos lead to fragmentation of people and policies and processes and data. Uh, all of the trillion plus companies uh, in the world that are worth a trillion dollars or more have taken a leap from an organizational centric to a user-centric or consumer-centric view, and government yet hasn't evolved there. Uh, there is no uh, good role models that I can see, except a few pockets within the state and local government, uh, where you can log into one place, have one digital identity, one digital passport, and get a 360 view of government. You know exactly uh, what the taxes are, what parking tickets you might have might be outstanding. Nothing is linked to you as an individual, uh, or as a household, or as a business holistically. So there's lots of good efforts. And Maryland certainly has uh, started efforts through One Stop and some of the other systems like MD Think that uh, uh, W Secretary Shine has talked about. Uh, but the idea of being looking at it from like, what's the life of a resident? What's the life of that individual or that household? And how do they interact? And how do you send them alerts and remind them of things? And how do you make that a mobile experience, not a web-based internet explorer, which is dated, or some other experience, but a mobile app experience? Because most uh, kids nowadays relate to technology through their mobile phones. They're not always on a web uh, application. And most of the government really hasn't adopted uh, holistically mobile applications either. But it starts with the digital identity per person. And that, that digital identity also secures, if you have a strong digital identity that secures that transaction or sets of transactions beneath it. Uh, so we are a big proponents of, of moving to uh, uh, consumer-centric views. I'll give you some examples of that in the next slide. So we've uh, created a, a payer dispute app in New York City. And, and we, we use this as a frictionless example because there's a lot of friction when you get a parking ticket, especially in New York City, because it's very expensive. Uh, New York City issues between eight and 10 million parking tickets a year, uh, and it collects more than 30 billion annually in revenue. Uh, the Department of Finance as a whole uh, collects that much revenue. So we created an app where you can pay or dispute the, the ticket. You can pay it on the spot, or instead of going somewhere you know, to a courthouse, and going through a trial process with the judge, uh, you can just kind of submit information that shows that you were innocent of this violation. And you would think that, you know, uh, of all examples around frictionless government, this would be the one that would be the hardest one to prove that you could make frictionless, but it's the highest rated mobile app in New York City uh, on, in the government uh, uh, sector, uh, where we have, you know, 4.7 out of five stars and 235,000 ratings. That's an example a frictionless government because you can very quickly deal with an issue. And I think most times in government, it's not the fact that you have to deal with the issue, it's the process by which you have to deal with the issue that really gets you frustrated. So these are uh, kind of examples because the, the goal of, of technology and government 
should really be focused on, you know, are you going to, is that, is the thing you're doing going to build uh, healthier, safer, or, or more prosperous communities and, and people? Uh, is it going to make happier residents? Because people do have an option to move to other places now with, with the, after the pandemic, with the successful use of virtualization. Uh, and then are you reducing the cost to deliver services? And by adopting this kind of a frictionless government model, you actually get all three outcomes. You get to save money, make people happier, and you get to the social outcomes around self-sufficiency and well-being uh, that you know, government is, is job is to drive those outcomes. And I think technology over time is gonna play a larger role. So we are, uh, you know, we're big proponents uh, of frictionless government and I wanted to introduce that concept. And I would just add one other benefit here is that this was leveraging data from a legacy application. So rather than wait until the legacy application was modernized to benefit the residents or provide a, a more frictionless experience for those residents, in this case, we were able to leverage the existing application and simply layer this on on top of it. So you know, it wasn't a, it, we didn't have to wait until everything was done with a modernization to be able to leverage a frictionless experience for residents. So um, if, go ahead. ahead. I was going to say, Christine's now going to give you some examples uh, and frameworks of like how you would approach uh, modernization. So if we think about um, how much needs to change and how many, you know, it sounded, it sounds like there's a lot of effort right now in terms of, of inventorying the existing applications and really understanding the landscape. Um, so from a core of how do we, how does this get done? We wanted to just give a little bit of light in terms of how, how to really start that large scale change um, in terms of achieving the outcomes that you're looking for. So the way that we see it really is that, um, you know, Maryland has a very extensive statewide technology master plan um, and has clear mission and values, vision and strategic objectives. And so what we're talking about really is this middle section of executing an IT application strategy that leads to specific initiatives because it's impossible to do everything all at once. It's impossible to get funding for everything all at once. And just from a work perspective, there are so many interdependent items in terms of the applications that need to get modernized. There's no way to do everything all at once. So there has to be some methodology and some framework for really understanding the operating environment, aligning between all of the different stakeholders to really understand what the risks are. And those are not just cyber risks, but they're also business risks or um, programmatic risks to be able to offer what you need to offer to Marylanders. In the sense of, of the next piece of it, it's really, there's a certain technical direction and dependency. So while one application might be able to be lifted and shifted to a cloud environment and improve scalability and security and stability, other applications may need complete rewrites or refactoring, and they might not be able to do that. So the rationalization understanding and the, that part of the plan really helps to review that technical direction so that you get a better sense um, across agreed upon criteria of what should be going where. And then ultimately, all of that information from your inventory, from, from moving through a common set of, of decision criteria allows you to create a plan with technical options because there's never just one option. Right now, this is a very exciting time to be involved in technology. There's so much change. There's so many new tools, new concepts. So you really have to think about what's going to give you the best outcome um, for the work. And that's where you can highlight within your roadmap those commercial off the shelf or SaaS um, as a service alternatives that can replace certain parts of the legacy application or the actual application, um, candidates for immediate uh, cloud migration to your existing cloud smart strategy and where those highest risk applications are. And we always argue that it's never just one dimension but it's really a combination of business and technical risks as well as cyber risks or just high cost. 
and it could be risks as well from a staffing perspective. So there are many dimensions to assess those that level of risk. If you go to the next slide, so this is where we'll end today, just in terms of what are the outcomes of why would you do this? So many states have taken a, we'll do an inventory to end all inventories first, and then come and do a rationalization exercise. And what we say is do rationalization with what you know first and start with that. And if you take it as a pieces parts, and maybe you'll do many different application strategies, there doesn't have to be one giant one, but maybe you start in a smaller area. And in that place, you can, your first and most important outcome is this comprehensive roadmap to realize what that target state application portfolio needs to look like. But along the way, you've created clear decision-making criteria that everybody has stacked hands on and agrees on which applications need to get modernized, which can migrate to the cloud or just simply be retired. The third important outcome is that you can't just create a new application and expect the same staff and the same structure to support it. So you have to have that plan for operationalizing and right sizing. So there has to be the right support folks. And if they don't have the right skills, then you have to understand how to reskill them and or create a new structure. And there's all the cultural change involved in moving, using a new application. Legacy systems have been in place for many, many years. That means that people have been used to doing their work that way. Changing that by swapping it out into another application means that they may have to relearn or learn a new skill entirely or perhaps something has been automated and they don't even have the job that they did. All of those aspects of operationalizing have to be considered. Mitigation of known risks. This is a big, you know, if you know that a legacy application has known risks, whether it's out of software support, doesn't have uh, staff to support it, or there are known uh, security uh, concerns, this is an outcome that you can clearly identify where those risks are and ask for funding appropriately to replace them. Another key outcome here is the identification of dependencies. We know that an application isn't unto itself an island, right? It's a, it provides data and really specific information across a number of systems. So identification of those dependencies are, are absolutely critical to know which applications need to be migrated and or modernized together so that you don't break existing systems. And then ultimately, IT and business decision makers need to be aligned because modernization cannot be simply a technical exercise. It has to be a business exercise. And that's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I'm looking around to committee members. Delia Feldmark. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm, I'm sort of on a theme today, I guess, and since you touched on the um, sort of the process of creating the inventory. <laughs> um, and and I think if I, I heard you correctly, I think you were saying you really don't need exhaustive inventory before you get started with the sort of rationalization exercise, right? And so I guess my question is, can you say a little bit more about how that works and kind of what the, what the right balance then is in terms of working through sort of your, your known inventory of issues that need to be addressed versus sort of completing the broader assessment to, to build a more comprehensive inventory? Absolutely, and, and um, that's a great question. And I will answer it in two ways. One is as a former CIO of an agency, agency CIOs all know their biggest issues. Every one of us was, was aware of where you had your biggest potential risks, both from a business, allowing my business to do the, the work because I would get all the complaints 
and from the technology that I knew was out of out of touch. So I think agencies can certainly highlight their top um, known known risk areas uh, very quickly. And then the second part of that is, I think one of the problems that many states and agencies have done in the past is is to get so much information that it becomes a data gathering exercise versus an actionable roadmap uh, exercise. And to that, I would say um, the minimal viable amount of information is really needed. So you have to think through what are the what are the critical pieces I need to crit critical pieces of data that I need to make a formative decision. And that's not a, a two-year exercise of, of inventorying every bit and bite, but it's really understanding the technical direction that I need to go in. Thank you. Yep. Chair Young, did you have a question? I do, thank you. And wanna, a lot of the presentations you gave answered some of the questions I had coming into it. Um, and it might be in the same vein as Delegate Feldmark. And because I understand too what you're saying, and uh, you, chicken or the egg, which one comes first? Do you do the inventory or do you have like a, an exhaustive inventory or do you just start? It sounds like you don't necessarily need it, and uh, which is good to hear. Um, but in terms of coming up with a strategy that has like an end state that you had mentioned, when it comes to dollars, when it comes to what it looks like, uh, obviously it doesn't need to be exhaustive and, and like you said, get bogged down with data gathering. This is something that you all provide and could provide to a state if, if, if asked. At the very least, the state should have some sort of understanding of where their legacy systems are at a base level, right? They should. Yeah. I mean, Correct. And then not even an example, like you said, not even an exhaustive, like, you know, every single piece of data. I mean, you're going to find things out when you're going through this process. But it, it would just be expected that to start a process or a modernization strategy that you would need to know what legacy systems exist within the state, which ones are operating, which ones are tiered, because which ones are the most vulnerable down to the ones that we can live with for a little bit longer. That's, that's an accurate statement, correct? Yeah, and the only addition I would, the only additional statement I would make is that if you don't know the level of risk entirely, at least you have a good sense of where those potential risks may be more prevalent. Yeah. And if you're starting from scratch, I, and I think some of the things that we've noticed too from talking with the department has been one department asking another to self-identify or provide that information. Uh, what's been your experience with if you've, if you've been brought on when you've seen other agencies start their strategy process of creating something? getting other departments to buy in. I mean, usually top down is all that they need, but if it's not starting from the top and it's just a department asking another department, how have you kind of got around that barrier of agencies self-reporting what their, what their legacy systems are? That's a, it's a great question. I think the most successful I have seen is when it was led by the head of that agency um, to have that agency understand the inventory that they had. I've, I've been party to IT application strategies at a state level where the state IT agency um, enforced across agencies. I've done it as an agency you know, uh, exercise as well. And I think it really just all ends up being more successful with a, a real clear understanding of what the exercise is meant to achieve and what the outcome to be expected is. Because if, if you've asked all agencies to do this and there's no direct next step for them, then they don't see the value in it. If it just becomes an yet another data exercise and that's what you would want to avoid. So it has to have a clear, and this is why I always advocate starting small, it has to be a clear outcome and that means either funding is available for a modernization exercise, or there's a clear next step um, and executive support for that step. Thank you very much. Yep. Senator, do you see any, any other questions? Seeing none, thank you for 
presenting. We'll be in touch and we'll keep this conversation going. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll move on to the, uh, I think our last speakers, uh, Mr. Nick Cook and Brian Bennett. Uh, in addition to GCOM, we have uh, these two representatives from System Automation. Over the last 50 years, they've served as a software manufacturer for government agencies. And in Maryland specifically, they've per, uh, partnered with the Department of Health, Labor, and our state police. Uh, Mr. Cook is the VP of Operations, and Mr. Bennett is the Director of Strategic Growth. Welcome, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Hester, Chair Young, members of the committee. Thank you for the time, for the opportunity to present today. As noted, my name is Nick Cook. I'm a Vice President with System Automation, joined by my colleague, Brian Bennett, who's the Director of Strategic Growth. As a Maryland-based business with uh, experience working with state government across the country, we're just here today to provide uh, our recommendations, share some lessons learned from other states uh, on how Maryland can best leverage the resources it has at its disposal to truly transform government um, by focusing on, and I promise we didn't steal this from Christine and Kamal, reducing the friction that exists between government and our fellow Marylanders. I mean, that is, that is a concept that we also very much believe in. And so this is the flow for, for today's discussion. We're gonna start briefly just by explaining a little bit about who we are at System Automation. Uh, we were founded in 1968. So we are plow, proud to be celebrating our 53rd year in business this year. Uh, and we're headquartered right down the road in Columbia, Maryland. So we've, we've employed um, hundreds, many hundreds of Marylanders over those 53 years. Uh, and we are a software manufacturer. So we are not an IT strategy consulting firm, nor are we a systems integrator. You know, we are here to provide the perspective, hopefully a different but welcome perspective of a company who goes to market with a software product that transforms and streamlines government. We have uh, a nationwide footprint that you can see here on the next slide uh, that we're very proud of, nearly 500 agencies serving over 800, uh, nearly 800 professions and have 20 million licensees that use our products each year. But here in the state of Maryland, we're also very proud to support these six agencies that you see. These agencies we think stand to benefit from the lessons learned and best practices that we're here to share with you today. And with all of our experience, you know, what we see is government realize the greatest return on its investment when it's investing in solutions that remove the barriers between government and the citizens it serves. And if done right, it puts people to work faster, it facilitates commerce, it contributes to the tax base. It's one of those rare win-win scenarios. And this is an area where we think the state has made a lot of great progress with its one-stop initiative, which we talked about earlier in, in the session. Uh, but we see more work to be done to fully realize that vision. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian, who's going to share with you um, how another state, the state of Indiana, with a solution called InBiz, approached the very same modernization challenge here in Maryland, but we believe was able to return, achieve a, a greater return on its investment. So Brian, I'll turn it over to you. Sure thing, Nick. Thank you. Uh, thanks everybody, and hanging on, hanging on long for this uh, meeting today and and such. But first, I just wanted to kind of we're going to play pretend a little bit. Pretend I'm a real estate professional in the state of Maryland, and I want to open an appraisal management company. Well, how am I going to do that, right? So right now, basically, I go to the Maryland One Stop site. And there's a lot of great information here about uh, different professions and businesses and things like that and, and whatnot. And so I'm kind of like, well, all right, I guess I'll think about uh, appraisal. I'm going to take my caps. Off. Okay, well, it looks like I did that. All right, a company registration, great. So here's some information about becoming and starting a, a company here in the state. So it looks like it's going to cost me like about two thousand dollars. That's great. Um, what are the different steps? I'll need to apply for this registration and download a form. Okay. So then I click on that. Uh, well, I thought I was going to get a form, but basically went to the Department of Labor site. And so on this page, um, I need to find this. Well, it looks like what is this? Seventeen fifty? What? I don't know what I did. But anyways, um, so it looks like I get to click here and download this form. And so it opens a Word doc. And so I open that up, whoops, and there it is. Um, so this Word document um, 
to register for this new company apply. Now it's saying $250. Okay, it's getting better the farther I go. It's went from 2000 to 250. This is awesome. But but what do I do with this? Okay, I guess I fill this out. I, I mail it. Um, how do I pay? Do I get to pay on? You know, it, it can be really challenging. So what am I supposed to do, right? And so, um, oops, I'm on the wrong thing here. So what do I do next, right? Maybe, I, maybe I'm calling my delegate and saying, hey, I'm having a problem here. Maybe I'm calling the agency. Maybe I'm calling my senator, right? How, how would you like that as a phone call to, to deal with? So, so it can be very, it can be very frustrating, frustrating if technology isn't applied uh, well. And so with that said, I do want to share a, a different experience as far as the Indiana uh, State Portal and what they're, they're doing. They call it InBiz, not one stop. And so let's go back there. And so uh, it's important to note that in the state of Indiana, uh, system automation is one of many on a team of different providers and, and contributors as far as uh, this whole system is concerned. But much like the Maryland uh, site, this is a, a place where uh, individuals, business owners and such can basically get lots of different information, submit uh, registrations and things like that. And so, um, as a, again, I'm pretending I'm an individual, I wanna start a, a appraisal management company. And so on the InBiz site, it's basically an account where I create that account and it's used as multi-factor authentic, uh, multi-factor verification. So then it makes it nice and secure. So then I'm able to go into a portal, a true dashboard to really support all the business that I'm doing with all the different state agencies whether I'm an individual business owner or, or things like that. And so you can see here, this dashboard is just different information about myself, like here's my license, and maybe I'm already own a uh, real estate brokerage. Um, maybe there's different messages from different agencies that I'm receiving here that I have an inventory of, or different documents or, or past payments. Um, what's in progress. This is really that holistic view from the individual or the business owner's perspective of all that they're, they're transacting with the state there. And so again, here, I want to start a new business. So I can just go up here and click. And it goes right into this thing that instead of a Word doc or a PDF form or whatnot, it's, it's a seamless experience where it's telling the user, okay, this, this is going to take you about 15 minutes. And what information do you need? Okay, I have that. And then I can go next. And uh, this system also off offers a business wi wizard. So instead of the individual calling the agency to figure out what are the next steps or what form or what place do I need to go, it can uh, guide that user to directly which system or which, which place they need to go. Um, but in this case, I'm a frequent user here. And since I already logged in, and I can start basically providing that information to the agency for me to get that registration in for a appraisal management company. And so you can see here across the top, there's a little dashboard that, and uh, line a progress bar basically telling the user, okay, where you're at, what's next and, and onward from there. So it's definitely a way that really contrasts between what somebody might be experiencing and uh, another state that's used uh, technology to provide that true one-stop sort of experience. So with that said, Nick. Thanks, Brian. So when Indiana got started with this initiative, um, the challenges they faced were actually quite similar to what Maryland faces today, right? And Maryland has built a really great, elegant interface, but, but as I said at the outset, um, there's still some work to be done. Um, and, and just like in Indiana, agencies um, are a little resistant to change, right? Humans are generally resistant to change, and I'm sure that that's been a bit of an impediment. Um, they felt like their ownership over their agency's mission was being stripped away. Um, and, it, and Indiana ultimately came to realize that this was a people problem and not a technology one. And they shifted their focus 
from here's this solution you need to start using it to let's build a complementary solution that integrates with what it already exists and is working. That's when the tensions subsided and the agencies really bought in. So that's kind of like the macro lesson learned there, but there's five, you know, sort of principal lessons learned that we want to um, share that we believe Maryland can adopt um, and, and will, will really ultimately reduce the friction between government and, and citizens. The first is a topic that's come up multiple times today, which is to perform an inventory of your current systems, determine what's working and what's not. Um, so as part of that inventory, you obviously need to evaluate the cybersecurity posture of those systems. Are they good enough to meet the cybersecurity needs of today and over the next five to 10 years? Do they align with the strategic one-stop goal? Um, and don't just assume because a system has been used for a long time by an agency that it, that it isn't a part of the solution. Truly assess what's working, what's not working, and then be decisive and, and move forward. The second is to form a vendor team with compensation tied to successful integration. That might seem oddly specific and weird for us to come here and say, say to you in, in a committee meeting, but we actually think it's really important because the point here is because this is not a technology alone problem, you're integrating people, process, and technology. Everyone needs to be all in on that vision. So you essentially, the partners that you bring to bear in support of, of an initiative of this scale need to, be, uh, need to be able to put their money where their mouth is. So we're often asked, well, how can procurement support this type of evolution? Well, this is one example where you're, you could align your procurement strategies with that theme, developing a truly integrated project team. And in Indiana, we were able to do that with really one pane of glass. We had one project plan, many different partners and vendors working off of that one project plan, integrating the development team workflow. So as our development team would produce something, it was an input to another team's development workflows and it truly became an ecosystem of partners and not just siloed partners doing their piece of the scope. Next is to avoid the one size fits all non-solution. There's no one solution that's going to solve all the needs of the agencies under the one stop. And it's, it's foolish to pretend otherwise. The, the problems faced today by these agencies are nuanced. Um, you've all heard the proverb, if all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. I am a technologist, so I'm not pointing fingers. It's very easy as a technologist to fall into that trap. Um, it's critical that Maryland not do that on an initiative with this scale. The next is to give agencies options. So if you try to cram solutions down the agency's throats, they're never going to buy in. So you have to give them options. Now, all of those options still need to lead to highly secure, integrated, user-friendly, frictionless experiences, um, but that don't take away the control of the agency to achieve its mission. That last point is very important because, and as, as noted in the last, above all else, this is not a technology problem. Technology will undoubtedly enable the transformational change. It will, um, but if you don't remember that the agencies that you want adoption from are people, many of whom got into public service to make a difference, just like each of you did on the committee, you're never going to realize the same efficiencies and outcomes as our clients in Indiana did. Integrating people, process, and lastly, importantly, lastly, technology is paramount to its success. Indiana was able to realize this vision and, and garner this, this return on investment uh, with a $3 million investment in its project for statewide professional licensing. Now, the, the, the mission of the InBiz One Stop is larger than just statewide professional licensing, but for that piece, it was a $3 million investment. And to date, Maryland has built a really elegant, great solution with the one stop, but the investment has, has far exceeded that number. And we believe the state's at an inflection point. And we hope that our lessons learned, the best practices that we shared can be incorporated into the future success of its transformation journey. Thank you for your time. We'll be happy to take any questions. Questions from the committee. Senator Hester, was that a hand up? I always have questions. I'm trying to let other people go first. Um, maybe while they're warming up. Um, I was just curious, you know, at the, at the start, you showed um, that picture in the six agencies. 
And I think this is the question that, that we, we grapple with. Like, do, do we need an inventory? How comprehensive does the inventory have to be? Like, where do we start? Because each agency is gonna advocate for their own project, right? They're gonna say, hey, I'm at the Department of Health, my project's most important, fund me. And that makes it difficult for you know, us to take a statewide approach of where the, the, the oldest legacy systems, the most vulnerable legacy systems are. So that first slide where you said, I would focus on these six agencies or processes, how did you get there? Well, th thank you for the question. I, I should clarify that those six agencies are system automation customers today. We weren't suggesting oh. that those be the first six. Um, though, you know, we, we, of course, we'd be happy to participate in that in, in support of our clients. But um, as far as the, I'm really talking more about as the one stop evolves and more agencies are integrated into it, the idea is um, don't just assume if there's a system there today that it has to go away. It has to be transformed right to the point that Christine made earlier. You, you, even if you've identified the, the system as a candidate for transformation or, or, or decommissioning at some point in the future, there's still a role for it to play in, in integrating with the one stop. And so the point is to not kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. Okay. Can I ask a follow up question then? Of course. If we were to do an inventory, uh, you know, of the agencies, boards, departments, um, first of all, who should who should do that? Should that be contracted out, or should we we use the you know the bare bones that that do it is pulling together through their survey of 114 agencies? Um, so, so who, who should do this in, the inventory? And then what characteristics or attributes of the, the of the their point systems should be studied? Is it security? Is it usability? Is it ability to integrate? Like, what do we do? Yeah, absolutely. It's also a very good question. So as far as the who, you know, that, that's dependent. Like you said, if, if do it is, um, it obviously makes sense on the surface that it would be do it to, to perform such an analysis. Um, but, you know, obviously they're trying to do a million things as well. And so if that were to be contracted out, I know there are a lot of really great uh, firms in, in the market that would be more than happy to come help support such an initiative. Um, so whoever does it, you know, ultimately that's, that's to be determined by, um, you know, ultimately the, the enterprise, right? Uh, with support from the agency heads. But as far as the, the inventory and evaluation is concerned, it's really twofold. So there's a functional evaluation, which is just really how well is the system meeting the agency's needs, right? Is it able to actually um, reduce the turnaround on issuing a license or a permit, for example? Is it is it allowing the agency to be nimble enough in response to statutory change, right? If you need to change, for example, fees associated with obtaining a license or, I mean, COVID-19, no, no question, right? We were extending licenses indefinitely, right? And for, for and, and you needed to that needed to happen very quickly. So evaluating the systems from a functional standpoint, how well are they meeting the needs? How nimble do they allow the government to be? And then there's kind of a technical assessment too, which Senator would, would address the point that you made about cybersecurity, right? Because th that is very evident in, in today's meeting. That, that's non-negotiable, right? I mean, at this point, if you're an organization that's not taking cybersecurity seriously and you want your product to be utilized by state government, and you, you, you can't, it's table stakes at this point. So making sure that it has the right uh, cybersecurity posture, making sure that it has, um, without getting too technical, uh, what are called APIs, which are really just programming interfaces that would allow that system to integrate freely with the one stop um, so that it really becomes this concept known of, as a system of systems, right? It's many independent systems coming together that in, in, in taken together become something unique and very powerful. Does that answer the question, Senator? I think so. Thank you. Sure. So, Delegate Feldmark. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, and thank you for sharing. You know this perspective. I guess um, recognizing that you are coming from from the vendor perspective. I I don't know. You know this this question may be a, a little bit. Um, well, we'll just go. Uh, <laughs> you okay. know, I think when, so you're already working with six agencies with the my license, right? Um, I think part of, you know, we heard earlier about the sort of patchwork <laughs> approach, right? And and we do have silos that are kind of dealing with this and, and do it is trying to have a, a more consolidated approach. But the reality is we're, 
we're not quite consolidated yet, right? So as a, as a vendor, what, what's your perspective on sort of how to pull the pieces together and how to expect vendors to, you know, integrate with each other, basically? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if you can speak to sort of the, you know, the example from, um, from Indiana, if that was, you know, if that was just sort of a, a clean slate with one vendor doing all of it, or, or was there integration of multiple vendors and how does, how does that work either yeah. from, from your perspective as a vendor and what would be your recommendation for the, for the state? Yeah. Thank you for the question delegate for sure. So to answer the last question first, um, in Indiana, it was many, it was, it was truly was an ecosystem. There were um, three or four agencies, right? So the InBiz is led out of the Secretary of State's office. That was the champion for it. Um, the customer that they integrated that, that happens to be our customer was the professional licensing agency. That's, it, that's the de facto standard for statewide professional licensing across um, the state of Indiana. Um, and there were three or four different vendors that got involved. I might actually be understating that number. There were vendors focused on testing and user experience and design and user outreach. And then, of course, you know, we were involved from the professional licensing perspective. Uh, and, and the one-stop experience, much of the one-stop experience that you saw Brian walk through, only a portion of that was even developed by us. So the point is, as, as I tried to make in the lessons learned slide, um, it, it, the lines need, can't beca become blurred, right? Because the idea is, if you're going to create a frictionless experience for your users, I assure you one way to make sure you don't do that, if you flip it on its head, is just let siloed contracts out to different vendors and just have them focus on their piece without some vision for what the consolidation is going to look like. And so what really made that successful was that top-down alignment between the Secretary of State's office, the agency had from, from our customer and the other agencies that participated. And it, it forced everyone's hand to operate as a truly cohesive team, all the way down to the procurement strategy, as I mentioned in the lessons learned slide. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. I think it's a, it's it's probably a an iterative and and ongoing process. But but yes, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So I have a question, and I just wanted to give you a chance to elaborate on this because I was uh, curious. You recommended providing options for the various boards, agencies, and departments. Uh, any of these could lead to the integrated state enterprise solutions uh, that you've been mentioning. What are some of those options that should be provided or could be provided? Yeah, so it's it kind of goes back to the hammer nail proverb, right? So the idea is um, it's, it's easy to kind of have preconceived notions about what a board is or isn't doing well. And it's not really until you dig your, you, you kind of roll your sleeves up and dig into the work that you figure out how well is the system truly meeting its alignment. And I think it's also very easy to fall into the trap of if a system has been used by a board for you know, a few years or several years, that, that automatically makes it legacy, right? The, the point is that, that the tenure of the system at the agency shouldn't matter, right? Whether or not it's actually meeting the agency's requirements and can fulfill the technical requirements does. And so the, option, the options could be anything ranging from keep the system you have, but can we build, can we have interfaces to the one stop? so that we don't have to re-engineer the underlying line of business system, right? So the idea is you just kind of put in, I, I talked about the programming interfaces earlier, right? You just put these APIs in place so that our, the system can talk to the one stop and vice versa, truly seamless system of systems. If you come across a system, a system for example, though, that doesn't meet the criteria, maybe the cyber security posture is so poor that it, it's really a non-starter, well, then you have to have alternative solutions, right? You have to be able to offer maybe a COTS alternative, or maybe there's um, a solution already resident within the one stop that could be applied to support that need. So the idea is um, avoiding the one size fits all assume, and, and kind of not assuming anything um, and, and to be able to, to let the agencies keep what's working for them um, and offer them solutions for what's not. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Sure. Further questions for Mr. Cook, Mr. Bennett? I don't see any. All right. Well, we very much appreciate the time and the opportunity. So thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think 
Chair Young, I think this closes out our agenda for today. Um, I would agree. I think so. Look at us ending 10 minutes early or nine minutes early. Um, I just wanted to say um, thank you to all of our panelists for joining us this afternoon and sharing multiple perspectives with us. Um, I think if uh, we, we absorbed a lot today on this committee, and if anybody has follow up questions that um, they'd like to uh, they'd like to have answered, please uh, email those to committee staff, and the committee staff can then follow up, you know, with the various panelists to answer those questions. Um, as I said in June, you know, we're in an increasingly digital environment, and um, the cyber attacks that we face at all levels of government are. Um, are you know need to, need to be dealt with, and I think that this committee is um, is moving towards doing this. I just wanted to to, um, to 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 foreshadow our next committee uh, meeting is in about a month um, at the end of October, and um, that will really focus on the results of the Maryland Cybersecurity Council study. They're looking at um, three things: the overall governance of cybersecurity in the state and how that compares to other states the security posture of our um, state agencies. And we hope that the Department of Information Technology will be able to share some kind of anonymized results you know, from their, their survey work this, uh, this interim. Um, and then third, the, the, the results of our um, local, local listening sessions. Like I said, we've listened to the school systems, the county uh, IT directors. We've had conversations with each emergency manager, you know, at the local level. And I think if we combine all that, we'll be in a really good position to um, bring forward some um, cutting edge legislation um, for, for next year. So, so um, I just wanna thank you for your time and attention and staying engaged for two hours and 23 minutes. <laughs> Any closing remarks from you, Chair Young? Thanks, Senator. And I'll I'll be brief. Uh, one, thank you to all the panelists uh, who participated and took this seriously. Uh, I'll share the sentiment of my uh, co-chair from the Senate and looking forward to the next meeting where we will be bringing back Do It to present. I feel like an opportunity was missed here, um, and I just want to be clear. Uh, it's, it's not fair that they're not here, so I'm going to. I'm not trying to place blame. I just want to say that uh, we're we're past day zero. This isn't theoretical. We've already been attacked. Baltimore City has, Baltimore County public school system has. You know, we're not, this is not an exercise in futility. We were trying to solve problems that we have consistently heard from other states do it better. And it sounds that we're not even at a place where we can even start to implement a plan because we don't even have the basic information of what our legacy systems look like. Even though every year from the appropriation standpoint, we consistently put more money into our legacy systems that apparently we won't know if we're done that because we don't even know how many we have. Looking forward to the next meeting and hearing more information from Do It, and thank you for everyone that participated and shared their information and their background and their information for this hearing. Thank you so much. All right, I'm gonna end the meeting.